Alive and Well STL is a presentation of the St. Louis Regional Health Commission and Rare Gem Productions to build a healthier St. Louis. Power up with the positive. Learn more at onerarejem.com. That's O-N-E-R-A-R-E-G-E-M.com. Support for Alive and Well STL comes from Beyond Housing. Helps entire communities become better places to live. Learn more at beyondhousing.org. The Regional Health Commission works in partnership with regional health sector advocates and stakeholders to improve health care access, reduce health disparities, and improve health outcomes for the uninsured and the underinsured in St. Louis City and County. Alive and Well STL with Bethany Johnson Javois, CEO of the St. Louis Integrated Health Network and Managing Director of the Ferguson Commission. Today, we are joined in the studio by Orvin Kimbrough, President and CEO of the United Way of Greater St. Louis. You know, my mission statement is always tied to seeing the best in others and helping them see that. When I was a young person, you struggle to have a vision, and sometimes you have to borrow somebody else's vision uh, for your life. And so uh, the way I orient my, my life is focusing on others, and I think when you focus on others, good things happen for you. We'll be right back. Everyone has a part to play in this, and that everyone must play a part in this, because this cannot be from the top down. It can't be mandated by the federal government or by the states or whatever. This has to be done in an individual, person-to-person, heart-to-heart, soul-to-soul, community-by-community. This is how this work will be done, to transform communities from the inside out, to create a healthier uh, community in every way, physically, emotionally, mentally. And I think that by connecting each other, that's how that begins to happen. When we realize that we have so much in common, that we're so much more alike than we are different. If we as a community have an awareness and understanding to react and respond differently to situations in our lives, we are going to create true community change. We have to recognize the true cause, the root of what's wrong with somebody. Working not to address the symptoms, but to address the cause. It's time to thrive. Be alive and well. Join this movement at AliveAndWellSTL.com. The first thing I want to do, Orvin, in talking with you is to ask you one of our key questions. What does it mean to you to be alive and well in St. Louis? I think it's the difference from being alive and just making it. Being alive and well is about ensuring that your entire self is in good working condition your mental, your physical, your emotional, your spiritual are all aligned and functioning properly. It's about understanding the interconnectedness of these concepts and tending to each to live a life more abundantly. I think we all have our struggles with being alive and really well, no matter our upbringing. I think there is a healthy dose of stress in our environment, and if not managed, uh, can be toxic. And what resonates with me is living an abundant life. Alive and Well, STL. Hello and thank you for joining us today. I am Bethany johnson Javois, host of Alive and Well and Managing Director of the Ferguson Commission. Today, we are joined in the studio by Orvin Kimbrough, President and CEO of the United Way of Greater St. Louis. As we talk and think about what it means for our community to be alive and well, I'm so pleased to be speaking with you, Orvin. Thanks for joining today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Your work in providing resources to the most in need in our community is instrumental as we become alive and well. Got a little ways to go, but we're getting there. So we're eager to hear from you today. I want to start off by asking you a really simple question. Sure. What principles guide how you live your life? I think the first principle for me is faith. Faith is uh, so important to who I am as a person. Faith gives me hope that despite many challenges uh, that I've had that this community is going through right now, that there is a purpose to all of this. And on the other side is uh, something incredible. I remember being introduced to you as you were leading Faith Beyond Walls. And in a lot of ways, the organization and the title Faith Beyond Walls reminds me of you. Can you talk a bit about how, you know, in your personal life, faith has lived beyond walls for your work and your purpose? Yeah, so I grew up in the state of Missouri foster care system. I entered the system when I was eight and I aged out at 21. And when you are a kid in care, you are exposed to so many of the challenges that this world has to offer. And you've got to find a way to, you know, have a vision 
and, you know, to take yourself out of that particular place. And I think uh, Faith Beyond Walls, just the concept, the idea of it uh, says that you can have uh, barriers, you can have mountains, you can have challenges, but you can mount those walls. And so that was my work with Faith Beyond Walls. Now, it was framed a bit differently, but that was indeed uh, my work. Do you have a personal mission statement that you live by? You know, my mission statement is always tied to seeing the best in others and helping them see that. When I was a young person, you struggle to have a vision, and sometimes you have to borrow somebody else's vision uh, for your life. And so uh, the way I orient my, my life is focusing on others, and I think when you focus on others, good things happen for you. So when you were young, who did you borrow from? Who was in your environment that you could draw from at that time? I think that there were a number of people at different times. There was never one consistent person uh, in my life. I didn't grow up with parents in a traditional sense that uh, you think about uh, uh, parents. But I had neighborhood friends. Uh, I had counselors. I had therapists. I had teachers. I had uh, sports coaches who imparted in my life at key points and that really provided me the fuel to get to where I am today. I think of three words in order to frame this interview. One is about this very relevant topic that's happening in our community and to us individually, which is trauma. Mm. Second word is triumph. And the third word is treasure. Mm. So as I think about those three words, I'm going to ask you questions kind of in those buckets. Mm. We talk about trauma Talk about trauma in community. We really have a concern about trauma with children and how important it is in young lives to understand, intervene, support, and love at that space and age. If you would for us go back to when you were a kid and talk a little bit about the trauma, which will take us to the triumph. But I just wanted to hear more about your story of what was happening as a young black boy here. I think one way for me to convey to your audience is to read a poem that I wrote um, when I had just really become a man, but it was it's something that underscores um, many of the challenges. I score pretty high on the ACE, which you can you know talk about, but I, I'm at a 10. I'm a 10 out of 10. And it's interesting, I was reading a book, and the author said that, if you had a four or more, you are a ticking time bomb. And so I think I'm so fortunate to be where I am because statistically I'm not supposed to be here. Here I stand, all grown into a man, eagerly awaiting God's great big plan, wondering how things would have been had your life not come to such a tragic end. Thinking back, it still doesn't make sense. Though I never felt your unconditional love, the pain was still immense. There are so many things that I want to say as I stand here and reflect on that catastrophic day. The precipitating events that culminated in your death consumed your every move till you exhaled your very last breath. You injected your veins with poison to further escape your reality, you drank in excess. You prostituted your body in search of money and love, which you never did find or get. You allowed many invasions to take place within our home. I looked at you as my security above all, and yet you were always gone. You placed all others before me. How many ways did this manifest? You were naive to the motives of a living guest as he crushed my childhood innocence. You neglected to hear my cries. You neglected to see my tears. You neglected to tell me that you love me, even if it wasn't sincere. You caused me to experience that kind of hurt that doesn't cure so easily. It's taken me years to get to this point, but now I found peace within me and I forgive you. Who was that addressed to? My mom. And in that case, how long did it take you to get to a place where you could put pen to paper to articulate that? I'm still putting pen to paper to articulate that. What is that process like for you 
Is that one of your ways to address trauma and get to spaces of healing? It's coping. It provides an outlet. And you will find that people who endure trauma, everybody has kind of a, a different way of going about the coping. But this is one of those productive ways. When you put it down on paper and you're able to verbalize it, it's liberating. And I think it's also empowering for others who have yet to find their voice and the courage to speak about these things because they can be shameful. I think there's a misperception that there's a point of trauma and a point of healing. You mentioned the word coping. Hmm. Could you dismiss this misperception and how pain and healing for me evolves and they live together? Yeah, I think you just narrowed it. It's a parallel track. I'm always healing. I'm never done. I think when you go through something traumatic, anything, you carry it with you. It's a part of who you are. While it doesn't define you, it's a part of you. It's always there. It's like, you know, the alcoholic who says, I'm always recovering. It's the same exact concept. So you have a son and a daughter Mm -hmm. and things can be generational. Are there times when you find yourself needing to break the cycle because of your history? Or how do you go about passing on the healing process to your son and daughter, given what you've been through? I think absolutely things can be generational. I think uh, particularly when you are in the same environment, you have the same pressures, the same struggles. They're seeing the same things. My kids don't have that exposure. My kids understand about my journey. They've seen it in the sense that I've taken them to places and explained to them, but their exposure is so different because I choose for it to be different because I can make it different. There are an awful lot of people for lots of reasons who don't have the choices that I now have. Can you speak to those that would point to your poem and point to you, and they do this, that say, He pulled himself up by his bootstraps. I always cringe when I hear people say, I did it, because it's never I. It's always a a community of people uh, who rally around you. You certainly have to want it. You've got to, at some point, acquire a vision for yourself. But uh, it absolutely requires a collective response. I've worked hard. I continue to work hard. I want to absolutely be excellent in everything that I do, but I also understand the importance of having people in my life who are my supply line. My supports. My supports. You know, in the military, you don't outstrip your supply line because if you outstrip your supply line, that's death. And so in life, you know, in civic life, you know, we call those supports. We call it social capital. We call it networks. We call it relationships. We call it institutions. But ultimately, we call it people who have just a committed heart and they're going to walk alongside you. But the idea of walking alongside you is just that. You too have to walk. I can't carry you. And so I think in all communities and when I talk to young people or older people, I don't accept, you know, the attitude that, I can't achieve. I can't do more. I don't accept it. I reject it. And I put in that place, here's a vision. Borrow my vision for you. But at some point, for this thing to go where it needs to go to, you've got to own it and you've got to work it. And you're going to have the supports that help you you navigate. Name a few of those supports that you feel are essential regardless of your circumstance and your history and your story that you just have to have in order to be able to borrow someone's vision until you get your own? I think one support just ties back to caring people. I think so many folks, and I see this, whether we talk about poor people or people who have abundance, you can live in abundance and be isolated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so... And what do you mean by that? How is that possible? How is that possible? 
I can um, have stuff. I'm surrounded by people. I'm smiling. I'm showing up. I'm being what you need me to be. So what do you mean? You know, isolation, I'm talking mental. I mean, you can be physically in a place and mentally in a totally different space. You know, people don't see you for the things that you are absolutely going through. And again, I know people who have resources and people who don't have resources. We all have uh, similar struggles. Money buys some things, but money don't buy all things. What's the risk for you to be exposed, to be open, to be present, bringing your full self authentically in this environment in St. Louis? There's some exposure and there's some risk with that. What is the risk and why have you made a decision to take the risk to be this transparent? not only about your story, but to step into spaces that are uncomfortable in your professional life and beyond. Why are you doing this? My mother died when she was 28 years old. For the longest time, I didn't expect that I would live past 28. I turned 40 this year, this past year. I think we're all on borrowed time. There are no risks for me. I think it's important for us to speak truth, but to be smart about how we speak truth. I think that sometimes we say things to get things off of our chest and there is no value outside of getting it off your chest. But if there's value in what we're saying for others in terms of helping others realize their full potential, helping others intellectually, emotionally, psychologically actualize So I think that's really what it comes down to. If my being visible in some ways helps to provide encouragement to a generation who feels lost, a generation who feels hopeless, a generation who hasn't seen many people like them do anything that they consider significant beyond the traditional things that we think about sports, athletics and, you know, and dealing No, I resonate with you. It's something about turning 40 that I just did, too, in October that I didn't expect. It's got me being real pensive and thoughtful about truth telling and legacy at 40. So I don't know if you're having that same experience. But one of the questions I'm asking at 40 as I'm looking at the generations that are coming behind us is what did we miss with them? What are we missing? What happened? What is your reaction to that? What are you thinking? I don't know what happened, but I'll tell you that I started my career in the Jeff Vandaloo neighborhood in my 20s. And Jeff Vandaloo really had two distinct populations at that time. They had who I call the old timers, uh, the people who were the keepers of the vision. They were around when Jeff Vandaloo was maybe on the decline, but still just a powerful community. And you had young people who did not have a perspective of what that was. This was a a place where people who could not buy property were able to buy property. There was a sense of pride. And so what's happened, I think, over the last 20 years is these communities have fallen in into tremendous hardship. And so you have a, a generation of kids who all they've seen is the devastation. That's all they've seen. And you have the older people who were the keepers of the vision. They're dying. They're passing on. And so if all I've seen is devastation and hopelessness and despair, if all I've seen is uh, crumbling infrastructure, schools that half educate me, jobs are gone. I mean, what do you expect? So we have to project a different vision for this region. And it requires us having honest conversations. It requires us thinking collectively as opposed to the fractured nature in which we do most things in this region. It requires us to have courage. It requires us to challenge anybody who suggests that just because you come from a certain neighborhood that you are destined to become less than what I believe God has placed in you to become. I think that's the other piece of the void and the keeping of the vision. The number one thing when I talked with you, you said was faith. And 
these generations look in the pain of where they're at, they're asking the question, where is God? Is there a God? And that's heartbreaking. And it's heartbreaking because I believe the way God shows up is through other people. God shows up through other people. And our neighborhoods are such that other people don't want to come in. And so we've got to create the conditions that inspire the people who are in the neighborhood and who are productive and who still have a glimmer of a vision. And then we have to create a bridge for others to come in and join with them, to work alongside them. This is, on one level, about social capital. It's those networks. It's those relationships. It's the exposure. But it's also about understanding from a business perspective that these young people are our human capital. Our investment in them today will dictate their productivity tomorrow. And we need some bridge builders. So when I listen to you speak, I'm really moved because I don't know how other people do it, but there's like a call to my soul. And I think that there is a call to all of our souls. To step into these spaces. And you don't want to do it by yourself. It's hard because it's a big space. It's a huge space. And so this is why we need an army of caring, committed people who are just not talking about it, but they're being about it. And everybody has a lane. This is why we need our churches, our synagogues, our mosques, any institution that is an aggregator of people to deploy those people into the world. When you are standing alongside others who got your back, when you've got the back of of the most vulnerable, it's something powerful. It is exhausting to be in that space And feel like you're there all along. But it's exhilarating because it's the most alive you can be. You're talking about alive and well. It's Isaiah 58 classic repair of the breach. When you're standing in the breach and you can feel that stretch because of what the breach and how large the chasm is. And yet, you know, you're called to that space. Mm -hmm. For me, at least, there's no greater purpose I can fulfill. There is no greater purpose. And for me... I want to make sure that we inspire others to step out on that same faith. How do we do that? I think we do it just by doing this. I think when people see that, wait a minute, somebody else you know, shares you know, this viewpoint that we're not done yet, yeah. that our kids absolutely matter, that there are uh, families who just need a, a little encouragement that there are seniors who just need somebody to be there. I think when other people see, wait a minute, there's a conversation going on, they want to be a part of it. And so we understand that there is nothing simple about changing the trajectory of a generation. Human beings, by our very nature, we are complex But we've got to find simple ways for people to plug in Mm -hmm. and show them how their small act connects with other small acts to do something pretty powerful in the lives of people Mm -hmm. and ultimately communities. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to someone who the fear and taking the risk and the fear of being transparent has them stuck before they can get to their purpose and really meet that soul call. What, what would we say to that individual who's listening and can feel it but doesn't know how to activate? I think it's really one foot in front of the other. I know that sounds so general, but just do something. You know, take one step, take one action. It's never about you. It's always about someone else. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you can find your purpose simply by encouraging someone else in their purpose. That's really true. And before you can really live out something else for someone else, you've got to be very in tune with what you're called to do. Mm. And it's true. 
I think yeah. people think about purpose as ultimate. They think about purpose as Martin Luther King, I have a dream and there's a mountaintop. But purpose has been lived out day to day in your daily yes, in your daily yes and obedience. That's right. Making that intentional decision to say yes. And that Monday leads to Tuesday, leads to Wednesday, leads to five years, leads to 10 years. And boom, you're 40. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you're 40 and you're like, okay, right. Uh, I got to get to work. Where's the roadmap? Right. What? Right. And then you're 80, you know, yeah. and then you become like my parents say they're in their 80s. They now are the vision keepers, mm-hmm. but they still remember being the five and six year olds. And they're looked to to be sages, and they're like, okay, I'll play this role. But internally, my body looks a certain way. But internally, I get it. Mm -hmm. I'm just disconnected because you see what you see. Mm -hmm. But I'm here. Right. And that goes back to everybody has a a role to play, and we can't discount any person. I was in a a restaurant yesterday and was sitting in the corner meeting with a few people, and the meeting ended, and this woman came up and she was in her seventies and she says, you know, I'm plugged into the city and I'm plugged into this and that, but I'm just old. And Mm -hmm. I said, boy, but your energy emanates from you. I'm excited just to be in your presence. I think we all have something to give. I think even people who think they don't have anything to give, they are the most, they feel like they have the least in resources. They are, Uh, what we call the impoverished, they too have something to give. That's right. Out of your deficit, out of your abundance, you still have something because you're still here. You're still here. So that leads me to the last part. I think we've talked about trauma. I enjoy talking about and tearing up about triumph. What do you treasure? I treasure my family. I treasure my faith. I treasure my time to reflect. I treasure encouraging other people to be their very, very best. I treasure every day because I'm not supposed to be here. And so from your vantage point, at least in this season where God has assigned you to sit in a place as president and CEO of United Way, what are you able to see our St. Louis's, any St. Louis's treasures? I think our biggest treasure ties directly back to our people. I think sometimes those who don't have resources have a certain perspective about those who do have resources and those who do have resources have a certain perspective about those who don't. And there's a misunderstanding. And so I sit in this space of trying to, for lack of a better way of saying, be multilingual to try to communicate at multiple levels with people that we all want the same things in life. Some of us have many more struggles with securing those things, that state of mind, but ultimately we all want the same things. And when you operate from a a perspective of scarcity, it creates so many more complications. But when you have an abundant frame of reference that there are enough resources it changes everything i think we're missing out on the treasure because of the narrative and we need to change the narrative what do you think are the lies that we have internalized and we're replicating and we're saying in this narrative that needs to now change into a new truth i think one of the unfortunate things that i see across our region and, you know, certainly across our country is this idea that whether you are in the so-called haves or you are in the so-called have-nots, that there is a monolithic people, that everybody has the same level of aspiration and inspiration. And it's just not true. In poor communities, you have people who are incredibly driven but they also have incredible challenges. And you have some people who are not driven. But just because you have a few people who are not driven, it gives us no right to broad brush that entire community. I think that's unfortunate. So, Fair enough. And the way that you perceive yourself is the way you also see things. So 
as a man thinks, so is he. And that environment is what he creates. So part of this narrative is an internal one, too, that plays out, I think, with people. So some of the assumptions we make about folks come from places way deeper in core places. You talked about the ACES study, actually, where you were a 10 on that scale. And I think a lot of people are impacted by those same factors, but just show a certain narrative. So we need to do a better job of loving people beyond what we see. I think that's one of the the mandates that, you know, that I receive. You know, you don't like everybody, but you got to love them. <laughs> I like you today, Bethany. <laughs> yeah. Be courageous and love me through my stuff. That's right. <laughs> so before we close, I just want to open this up to ask you to share anything else that's on your heart or in your preparation to share. Clearly, writing is an avenue with which you find spaces and places to express yourself. So is there anything else you wanted to offer to the audience or to us today? The thing that I would leave you all with is it's an incredible privilege for me to get to do the work that I get to do. Understanding where I've come from. I understand these streets. I understand these neighborhoods. I understand the challenges. United Way has been around for a long time. We were established in 1922. And this past year, uh, we went through this whole process and we asked ourselves the question, why does United Way exist? And where we landed is we exist to create conditions to help people live their best possible lives. And for me, there is nothing more inspiring. We exist to challenge the absolute best in every citizen in this region. We understand the complexity of the issues that we face as a region. We understand that while we think often that there is one solution, there is one organization that is the panacea. It's absolutely not the case. It takes multiple kinds of organizations. But even beyond that, it takes an army of caring and committed people plugging in at the heart level to change lives. As we change lives, I'm convinced that we can change the trajectory of a generation. We have to believe that we can be better. And we have to commit ourselves to that. I have a blog. I encourage you to check us out, reimaginingourfuture.org. If you're interested in getting involved in service activities, I encourage you to check out the United Way website at helpingpeople.org. I encourage you to check us out on Facebook, check us out on LinkedIn, Check us out on Twitter. Just check us out. I took away from that plugging in at the heart level. So many things I've taken away from this. I um, and don't even really want to close, but I do want to say to you, thank you for, well, I'm glad that we're in the same age range. I think there's some kind of movement going on. There's many leaders I can point to that's kind of in this group of bridge builders and just want to invite other people, please, to join within the space of the movement And I don't mean the movement defined by how people define it. I'm talking about this spiritual, intangible, gut level, something in the atmosphere movement. And find yourself saying yes more than no. Or find yourself saying maybe more than no. Because maybe can lead to yes. But find yourself moving in some way is uh, my personal plea to those that are listening today. So if there's nothing else you have to share. Then I want to thank everyone again for listening to another episode of Alive and Well STL. Alive and Well STL. We are grateful for your gift of time to this conversation. We encourage you to stay involved and get involved. If you, your family, or your organization is interested in talking about how we better the well-being of the region, sign up for more information, join the conversation, log on to AliveAndWellSTL.com, and let's build a plan on how we can work together and improve our overall health and become alive and well. The Regional Health Commission with Chief Executive Officer Robert Friend Jr. committed to providing a detailed review of change over the past decade in 14 leading health indicators for the city and county of St. Louis. The first decade review of health status report. An update to building a healthier St. Louis. Discover the narrative, the data, and celebrate the progress already made to improve health care access and reduce health disparities in our region. Learn more at STL 
S-T-L-R-H-C dot O-R-G. Alive and Well STL is another positive production of Rare Gem Productions. Thanks for listening.